This episode is brought to you by Fortis et Fidelis, honoring the brave and faithful service of our fallen. The free will never forget. Are you interested in creating your own podcast? If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First, it's free. Secondly, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brave and Faithful Podcast. I'm your host, Radian Dionisio. Um, I've got another special guest here. He is a Navy veteran, a combat wounded Navy veteran. Um, also owns this uh, business called uh, J. Crow Consulting, helping uh, the civilian sector uh, and teaching them uh, tactical, tactical care. Teacher T Triple C is what we call him. Uh, I have none other than good friend John Crowley. John, what's going on, bro? Uh, not much, sir. You? I'm good, man. Uh, so, just starting off, tell us a little bit about yourself and your and your service. Well, uh, kind of a interesting adventure. So, before I joined the Navy, I was a firefighter and did EMS law stuff too. I went to college 2006 to 2009. I got my uh, associate's degree, whatever, 2006, 2008 in the fire service. Uh, did the whole firefighting academy and all that jazz and had some experience at EMS before I went in as a corpsman. I kind of was a, a young, you know, dumb, you know, ignorant kid. And I, I kept partying, drinking, chasing women, you name it, done it all. And I was like, well, I probably should get my life together. So I joined the Navy in 2009 as a corpsman. I figured, oh, just, I just joined just to beef up my resume. Why not? You know, because I couldn't get a, a full-time fire job. So mm-hmm. basically I went to Great Lakes boot camp. And then uh, after boot camp was a uh, Corman school, the old school Corman school in Great Lakes. Uh, basically, I just went across the street, went to A school and Corman school. And then after that, uh, I was dumb enough to pick uh, Gitmo uh, tw- in uh, 2009. So I was I was stationed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Naval Hospital there uh, okay. for 18 months. And uh, it's very interesting being blue side there. Let me tell you, we've done a lot of things there. Not just detain- detainee stuff, but like there's actual clinic there. You know, work primary care, the ER, uh, the ward, you name it. And we had the whole Haiti earthquake thing that happened down there too around 2010. So when I was done doing all that, uh, 2011, I went green side. So I went to FMTB West in Camp Pendleton. Okay. Well, it was, well, it was still all guys, by the way. It's, I guess it's now co-ed which is pretty interesting because I went there a few years ago. I guess it's now code. But, yeah, I went there when I was all dudes. And so I went there, did FMTV West, completed that. Then I attached a 1-7 Suicide Charlie, which is, like, out in 29 Palms. And they're Suicide? Like, <laughs> yeah, right? And uh, so I did all that. So I attached one seven Suicide Charlie. We did a workup, you know, for staying in Afghanistan. So you probably know that being a corpsman yourself. So we did, like, you know, bridge port, mountain mess training, road brush, all that stuff, right? Right. Did all the field ops and then went to Sang in Afghanistan in 2012. So we replaced like 3-7 or whatever. Uh, and if anybody tell you, 20, 2010-2012, uh, Sang in Afghanistan, Hellman, uh, shit was getting real. Mm-hmm. Especially for corpsmen and Marines. And actually, I lost a few friends there, uh, corpsmen and Marines alike. And uh, actually, this today is actually the anniversary of my Marines that passed away stateside that survived our night mass cast in Sangin. Today but, uh, is you said, yeah. Oh uh, wow, okay. Mark Sullivan, yeah, he uh he passed away stateside as, as a wildland firefighter, but so I did my thing saying, and you know had a mask, has did all our stuff, you know, say by say by as you need. It was it was a, a crazy deployment. Uh, when I got back stateside, you know I still had like you know a year or two left, so they made me a coyote, and uh, I had a blast. You know I was teaching T Triple C or CLS with TTCG with other uh, corpsmen that been down range. And it was, it was a blast. And we had all these Marines from different units, you know, train us. That, that was when TTCG had, like, money with Strat Ops and all of them. And we had, like, the you probably remember this, too. You know, remember, like, uh, 29 Palms and CACs? They had to do all, like, the moulage people right. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, I was a part of that. It was fun. <laughs> like, yeah. Get to do yeah, that for a couple cool months. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that for like my last like year and a half, two years, whatever, and I got out. But I had a blast. That was probably the best time in my hat had in the Navy was teaching in Twenty Nine Palms out in the desert. And the mock you remember like the mock towns or whatever? Yeah. They had the like towns. The flip- yeah, they had the flipped over Humvee or MRAP or whatever. They had like all the role players and explosions, all that stuff. Yeah, I was a part of all of that. It was a blast. Yeah, I think uh, I mentioned this before uh, when we were uh, message- messaging each other. I was with 172. Um, so I was there from 04 to 07. No shit. Yeah. Um, I was with Charlie my first deployment. And then uh, uh, we all, yeah, I was in Alpha my second de- second deployment. Animal, yeah, what's now called animal. Yeah, animal, like, animal camp. Yeah, yeah. One seven is a very unique unit. They went. They call it so. Like for one seven, for those of you guys who don't know, it's one seven animal, one seven Baker, one seven suicide Charlie, and I think now they call it one seven dog company for Delta. Oh, okay. Dog. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the most interesting Marine Corps unit ever because they have like you know they have like different names, and different history. That's that's funny, man. I didn't know you were with suicide. That's funny. Yeah. So, so your time in, you were, um, you were at Gitmo and then you were at Twin Palms with one seven. Um, what would you say was kind of like your biggest takeaway from your time in the service? Uh, learning, basically adapting with different commands. It's just like different jobs, right? right. You know, I have two, I work for fire departments. I work for, I volunteer for Columbus Fire Auxiliary, which is like in the city in Columbus, Ohio. Totally different tactics, totally different mindset, right? And it's the same thing working rural fire department. You know, you're on the sticks, you're it. When you're an EMT or paramedic or firefighter, you're it. So, like, I think in the sense, when you're going blue to green as a corpsman, it's the same mindset. So, we'll, we, when you're going to a different command, you got to know what you can and can't do. Hmm. And I tell that to a lot of my TCCC students, military and civilian. I'm like, listen, you can't always have, go by plan A. Always have a plan B and know what you can and can't do. And I think the military kind of taught me that to say, all right, not everybody's on the same page. So you got to know what different mindsets, how people operate. You probably know that as a chief, like your green side chief, it's like night and day being blue side versus green side chief. I mean, you probably know that. Yeah. It's a different environment and different people, uh, different way to go about things. But uh, it's all about just communication in general. Well, yeah. I mean, for example, you probably know this being a chief yourself, Green side chief is different than being a blue side chief. Like the chief's mess are way different. Like when you go in the hospital, you got the hospital politics, right? When you have green side, you handle it like a man. You know, you pull them in the <laughs> office and be able to chew them out, or you have the LPOs, everybody else handle them. Right. Yeah. You know, totally different mindset. So, how long were you in total? Five, Five years. Five years. How was your, um, how was that transition back to the civilian life? I'm not going to lie to you. It was hard. Um, I'm still having rough spots here and there, and I still go to the group, and I get therapy. Actually, honestly, man, like, even with my company, uh, with J. Crow Consult, I just do it for my mental health, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I try to – the best thing to hear is hearing students when they, like, save somebody's life, when they apply a turn, get somebody downrange or stateside. That honestly, like, makes my day, man. And uh, it was hard getting out because when I got out, I got treated like a boot again. I had to go through the fire academy again. I had to redo my EMT, my medical assistant. It sucked. Like, uh, probably the most humblest guy I met while my transition, a uh, guy named General Mark Arnold. This guy was a badass, right? One-star general, right? 30 years SF. He did the Ohio Fire Academy at age 48. Wow. Age four- <laughs> yeah. Like, imagine, like, you being SF for 30 years, and you go through the fire academy, being treated like a boot again, and getting yelled at by some 20, 30-year-old that has no idea about your background. And just take it like a man. Like, and he's, and he's, he's a humble dude, man. He actually nominated me for a military all valor, all that stuff too, for Ohio. But I mean, when you get out in the civilian world as a corpsman, you got to play the game, man. You got to play the game all over again, whether it's nursing, EMS, whatever. You got to start from scratch again. A lot of people don't understand that concept. Yeah. I mean, it's all about just staying humble and always willing to learn. Um, you know, even though you had, prior experiences from another environment or another field um just trying to stay humble right and and make sure that you're always wanting to learn different new things um how did how did your time in the service help you with uh you know going back and becoming a firefighter um 
there were some pros and cons to it, but like I think it helped me out realize that, you know, there's always somebody out there having it worse than me, right? right? And I think, you know, me seeing death before the military kind of got me ready for places like Gitmo or Sangin. And I think, like, even this past week, I don't work the fire service. You know, actually, it's got shift today. You know, you see people out low, and it makes you like it kind of humbles you in the sense, like, man, I could I could be having a bad day, but this dude in front of me that's dying or overdose is having a worse day than me. You know, yeah. And I think the military kind of got you. And you probably know that being a chief or with your with your deployments, you probably saw some pretty crazy stuff. Like, man, you know, this sucks, but at least I'm not that dude. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It- I like that point where you brought up, you know, someone, there's always somebody there that has it worse than you. Uh, I think that's a good perspective. Um, kind of just brings everything into, um, brings everything to mind in, in reality, like how, uh, how to go about and uh, go about your business. Right. Um, so talking to John Crowley here, for those of you guys just joining in, uh, Navy combat veteran. Uh, he's also the owner of J Crow Consult, helping uh, helping people uh, life saving measures in in field care and tactical care. Um, so, John, what's been I guess what's been what's been the worst moment or experience you've had, um, either in service or um, just being a firefighter, finding that second service, man. So I think, and since you've seen combat too, I think the worst thing I've seen other than like probably kids, probably kids getting banged up, uh, kids getting hurt or sexually assaulted or killed or hurt like or burned um, or people just dying in general. Like not every death is it's, it's similar, but there's always different like gruesome parts of it. And this it's, you probably know that as a corpsman, like when you smell death, like the burnt, like shit or blood smell, those are like things you'll never forget ever. Yeah. I don't, I don't care who you are. Like, uh, even for my squads, uh, night mass mass casualty in, uh, June 13, 2012, basically we're doing a night reconnaissance patrol and we're, you know, pitch black darkness, uh, make a long story short, you know, both, uh, we were dismount doing reconnaissance or doing night patrol or night OP, uh, two of my guys stepped on IEDs and a guy right next to me got killed. Um, and then had two double amputees above knee, had let's see uh, a few walking wounded, you know, critical walking wounded. My squad leader hand was all messed up, face was blown off. Uh, you know, Brad Ivington, who, who I'm probably gonna play at I- Xbox with tonight in Ca- Call of Duty, uh, he was above knee amputee, uh, his fingers were dangling, Chris's legs were, you know, Chris's legs were all like mauled above knee, hamburger meat, you know, our interpreter was all banged up. I took trap in a little cheek. Uh, Tinjip took shrapnel mouth. Uh, Mark Sullivan, whose anniversary is today, he was like all, you know, confused. Where everyone basically had TBI, but like, basically, make a long story short, like seven out of ten of us were injured. Wow. And it was probably like the longest two hours of my life. Like, granted, the night Kazabak, the British came like 45 minutes later, 45, 50 minutes later. Uh, Kazabak, uh, the two double amputees first, the walking, the three walking wounded second, the KI last, but myself. Uh, Tinjim, uh, Cartwright and Buttes secured the area and we stayed there and we waited for the ground Kazabak crew, the QRF coming. But like, that was like, again, that was probably like the worst two hours of my life. I mean, cause it was 45 minutes for Kazabak. And then like, after that, you know, we stayed and played and then they drove us back to the BAS and we're all bloodied up and I still had my ears ringing all blood all over my things. And, uh, and a lot of the Marines, there's, I'm actually trying to work for something. I'm actually trying to get the truth out there about our squad. Because basically, it was messed up about it, and this will make you mad as a chief. Basically, 1-7 was like 500 meters away from us watching this go down. And Marsoc was on the up, opposite side. They were watching us 500 meter, meters up, opposite direction. And we are basically in, in this village, and everyone's like, oh, what's going on? Well, they are literally watching us from the blimps and, dr- blimps and drones and PGSS getting our asses handed to us. Wow. Yeah, and that's why I'm kind of like, Kind of a little bit bitter about, it, but honestly, that's why I teach the the they keep the people's memories alive, our fallen's memories alive, but also like teach people going down range, like listen, learn from our mistakes, man. Yeah. Uh, like for example, I had um four students alone from uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. One was there for the Dayton shooting. Another one was from 
uh, was at the shooting that we were at at West Liberty High School that we had in 2017. The old department fire department I worked on, uh, they actually had an active shooter. A kid brought a shotgun to school and blasted another kid twice, point blank. The kid ended up living. Wow. So there's we had student one student that was there for that. We had another student that had a mask has in Africa, and she's getting like all these awards and recognition in the Air Force. That was one of my other students, and I had another one. Same thing, you know, car wreck, the plot of tourniquet. Like, it's just, it's just people don't understand. It doesn't matter if you saw combat or not. The training that we provide, like, you should know how to put a tourniquet on, whether stateside or overseas. Definitely. It's life saving uh, equipment. I mean, well, yeah, but again, you probably deal with, you, with your end on the military, you being a chief, you probably deal with people like, oh, I don't need this medical training. I'm like, okay, well, there's, you're not going to always have a corpsman around the corner. Yeah. And that's why uh, with our mass cas, I try to like I show my students like the videos and stuff of us getting blown up, and also other videos of me screwing up downrange. Like, let's saying, look, I'm not perfect, but learn from our mistakes. Uh, same with firefighting. Uh, we had a you know I had a kid die in my hands a couple of years ago. You know I had a kid's face go through a steering wheel, you know, in a car wreck. And it was during one of my guys' anniversary, and again, like we learned from it, you know, and, and again, smelling that blood, you know, smelling death. You know, it's the stuff that will always stick to you, you know? So, well, I appreciate you for sharing that, sharing their stories, man. And, and just to go back, like, how are you over, how are you able to overcome some of these experiences and these moments and continue to move forward and do your job? Honestly, man. And I'm going to say this for the record for a podcast, because there's certain people in my life that I don't think I'm getting help, but I, I go to group therapy I go to help. I go see professional help. I'm actually going to try to do Save a Warrior uh, on my birthday, which is October 18th. But I'm also going to try to like, I always try to stay busy. Yeah. You know, whether, because like if I don't stay busy, I get in trouble. I, I'll start drinking again, start chasing women, smoking, going back to my old ways. Like I was so bad. This will crack you up too. I was so bad a few years ago that my parents were more worried about me going to Vegas than, than staying in Afghanistan. That's how bad I was. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm trolling and like, I don't want to do dating apps I don't want to do that stuff anymore because I don't want to start from scratch again and yeah it's some rocky relationships but like you know that's the thing like I feel like military as a whole and civilian we need to get better at mental health mm. like MACE exams man there's so many times I got blown up like I, I lost track like there's people like, like oh man I got a purple from getting TBI I'm like yeah but I know dudes and girls that got blown up they ain't get shit you know yeah and I think like we need to get better at like doing critical stress debriefing, you know, PTEP or just, you know, mental health stuff because guys like you and I, like, yeah, it's second nature to us, but eventually, like, I'm sure you had bad days too as a chief. Like, you just want to like chew out somebody, just beat the crap out of them, but you can't do that, man. Yeah, that's not a, <laughs> it's not like the old days, I guess, from what, uh, from what people say in here. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, man. I couldn't be in the military. Now I see some of the military members now and like, it cracks me up because when I teach teacher, we'll see they're like, Oh, we should do this longer. I'm like, yeah, but you guys can barely stay for two days. And then they complain about us cussing too much. It's like, well, listen, like you're taking a trauma class and you think somebody that's going to bleed out for you. is going to like not swear. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They're dying. It cracks me up. Well, it cracks me up. I get people all the time. Oh, I want to be a T triple C instructor, but I never deployed or I never had experience. I'm like, well, if you come across someone like me or a PJ or someone like you, Chief, you know, they're gonna call. They're gonna find out real quick if you know your stuff or not. They're gonna find out real quick. Yeah. So just going back into um, to what you're doing now and how you're helping other people, would you say that's like the most rewarding thing is just hearing these stories from your past students of like how they were able to help somebody out just by applying, you know what you what they learned from your class yeah i mean that i think that helps my my mental health out too honestly yeah. myself and my, my other instructors are guys like you and me i got instructors that are military i got instructors that are not military they're like you know they have a strong medical background they work ems nursing or they're military currently or ex-military and i think that helps them with their mental health too when they hear students like give us good feedback or when they use it on the real deal mm. So, um, people might, our audience listening to this, so what, what are some of the things that, um, some actionable steps that you can kind of provide to them right now, as far as like, you know, being better at, um, you know, that skill set and applying what you've learned? Yeah. Well, I mean, 
if you're a corpsman, for example, get as much medical certifications in college as you can. Like, try to make yourself marketable. You know, don't sell for less and don't half-ass everything. Like, a lot of, and you probably see this on your your end, too. A lot of corpsmen, they, they think, oh, I'm this and that. You know, I'm going to be walking on water when I get out. Well, not necessarily. You know, if I knew what I knew now, I wish I would have got my LPN, my nursing, my, uh, my other stuff while I was in. There's actually a nurse you should probably look up, Chief. Uh, his name is uh, Kevin. Uh, his uh, YouTube channel is called The Boot Nurse, and he actually got his LPN and R, uh, BSN as an active duty corpsman. Okay. And, and I wish I would have done that when I was in, man, because if I had done that when I was in or got my EMT or paramedic when I was in, it would have been, probably been a lot more easier transition yeah. because the VA, the VA especially, that was a pain in the ass too. Even though I had a purple heart, or whatever, I had to pay $1,500 to get shrapnel on my jaw because I didn't know anything about TRICARE. Nobody didn't tell me shit when I was like an E3, E4 getting out because I just wanted to get out. And everybody's like, oh, you should stay in and do this and that and get medical retirement. But it's like, I just didn't want to deal with that, man. And I, and if you're Like I said, if you're going to be military or if you're in right now, cover your butt and get your P's and Q's taken care of, whether it's medical stuff, VA, certifications, college, get as much as you can yeah. while you're still in. I'm- That's probably the biggest thing. Go ahead. Oh, no. Yeah, keep going. No, that's basically it. I mean, you tell your sailors. I mean, you tell them to talk to me, man. Like, I won 2015 Military Medic Year Award for NAMT for EMS World. This will crack you up. I won that without a, a current EMT certification. <laughs> that was a big FU to, edit, like, the certain organizations because a lot of corpsmen, people don't realize corpsmen, we don't get EMT certifications. Right, yeah. And, and everyone's like, oh, well. You know, 68 whiskeys, four ends, they have all these alphabet suits. I'm like, yeah, but Corman, we still get shafted. I know Corman at the Valkyrie program, at the uh, whole blood transfusion program, they're not even EMTs or anything. That needs to change, man. Yeah, I think um, I'm glad you kind of brought that up because a lot of uh, the, the young, the younger generation, and I'm sure it was like that when we were coming up, was like, you know, they don't really focus on the future and they, they don't really think about like um, what's ahead if things things happen right if things don't fall the way they want it to, and they just don't think about that like certifications, uh, college, um, all they all they think about is getting out and away from the military. When in fact they should be thinking about how the military can work for them uh, while they're still in, right? Uh, because either way, um, you know the military will take whatever they can from you. So um, you, you got to make sure you take what you can from them as well. Oh yeah. I mean, even when I was in 29 Palms, I wish, you know, even though one seven kind of shafted me and kept putting me on the field, same with TTCG. I wish I would have done the uh, EMT training at Copper Mountain uh, community college outside the base right. or like ride with, ride with the fire department or done something like that, you know, like rather than drinking the barracks or, you know, go party in LA, Vegas, San Diego. I wish I would just focus on me and not drinking and girls. And I wish I would just done more stuff like that while I was still in, you know? Definitely. So John, what's uh, one, what's one thing that you want our audience to take away from this episode? You know, learn to adapt, you know, learn with, with the new world we live in, learn to adapt, you know, Everyone's like, you know, freaking about COVID-19. I learned to adapt from it. You know, you see, you see my stuff on Instagram, you know, we, with COVID-19, we still train people, Mm. you know, trauma still happens, whether people like it or not, it still happens with COVID-19 and, uh, adapt with new times. Always learn to go on plan B plan. A never always works. And, uh, it took me in recent years to realize that, you know, not everything's going to go according to plan. You gotta have a backup plan. Definitely. As they always say in the green side, man, stay separate Gumby, you know? Oh, yeah. Always have a backup plan and, and yeah, just just be flexible um, because things will not always work out the way you want it to, but. No, and honestly, plan B saved my life. You know, when I had my night mass cast, um, if you read the after action reports of it or if you want me to submit them to you, you know what saved my life was training, was my guys and I, because my med pack got blown up the second blast. You know what saved my life? IFAX, Nine Line, and Night Kazabak missions training. Because if my guys didn't know that stuff, like, you know, if my buddy uh, Zach Butes or, you know, any of my squad mates, if they didn't have training or they didn't, like, have repetition training, right. I won't be here talking to you. You know, 
and uh, Brad Imachan and, and Chris Van Etten, the double amputee guys, they didn't have any pain meds. Like they didn't have like the only pain meds I gave was like to Brad and I screwed up. I almost killed Brad. Uh, I gave him OTFC, it's tetanol lollipop. He took it out of my hand, chewed it and swallowed it. I was like, oh crap. But when I was trying to give him more meds, that's when the second blast happened. And uh, if it weren't for their mental toughness, you know, cause all I, all I did was apply tourniquets to them, pack their wounds, use basic, you know, self aid buddy aid to them. I didn't do anything Gucci. I didn't do whole blood transfusions. I didn't push like more meds. No, I just did basic stuff. And I think a lot of corpsmen, they need to master the basics before they do all the Gucci stuff. And I think, you know, people right now in the military, they need to like always have a plan B and learn how to adapt, but also still defer back to the basics. If that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, most definitely. And I appreciate you sharing that and, and, um, saying that, you know, training basically helped you, um, you know, help you save these, these, uh, Marines lives and, uh, help you over, um, overcome that challenge, right. That you, that you faced. Um, so, uh, for those of you guys that are just joining in and listening in and talking to John Crowley, he is a Navy combat veteran. Um, also does uh, J Crow consult helping civilians teach um, teachable C tactical uh, care. Um, so uh, John, so coming up to the last segment of the, the show here, um, I'm going to ask you guys, I'm going to ask you five questions that I ask um, all my guests. Um, first question is what's one hobby you enjoy? Awesome, man. I like doing what I do now. Not only I, I feel like teaching medical classes is a hobby for me, but also I like uh, volunteering or working firefighting to me. Like, you know, like I said, last night I had a blast with the guys I was on shift, right? You know, we had a bunch of fires, a bunch of calls. And the coolest thing I was cracking up, this will crack you up too. We were like eating sandwiches and dinner in the freaking fire truck while going to other calls. But I felt like I was in Greenside again. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. That camaraderie. Yeah, we still, yeah, and we're all just laughing, talking about girls and joking, cracking jokes at each other. I mean, cra- I mean, there's a guy that I work with who took a dump in somebody's house that was on fire while he was in the fire. <laughs> like, it, <laughs> it remind, like little things like that. Yeah, like hobbies like that. That's what ke- keeps me sane. You know, that's awesome. That's awesome, man. <laughs> all right. Uh, second question: If you had to choose one person, uh, dead or living, to hang out with for one day, who would it be and why? Uh, probably my, uh, my Marines and sailors and people that, and family members that I've, that I've lost over the years. Um, I always had that regret, especially people I was like kind of mean to, or people that I was kind of a jerk to. Mm. And then, then that's, that's probably like, you probably know this, you know, with your background too, you know, there's always like people I wish I would have said something or done something more with, you know? Uh, and I'm sure you lost guys from combat too. I, I'm, you probably had the same mindset. It's like, man, I wish I was a, I wish I would have bought that guy a beer. Or I wish I was cool with him. Or I wish I wish I could talk to him more and find out more about him. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you had that same mindset too. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, man, that's a good point. Um, you just never know. You just never no. know. No. And I, and I know you and I both know with COVID, COVID alone, suicides and domestic violences, overdoses have increased by like 200%. And I know for a fact, holidays and anniversaries, I always try to check on people. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Ne- uh, next question. Recommend a book for our audience to read. So one of the books that I just listened to audio uh, for Save a Warrior that I listened to, uh, it's called Change or Die. And, uh, that's pretty, it's pretty interesting because it talks about like psychology and it talks about like how a lot of CEOs like Dick Cheney to like IBM, how, like how they run a business, but also feel like gratification on certain things. Um, the, the other book that I prefer, uh, with audio book, uh, what is it like to go to war? And it, it talks about like a Vietnam Marines experience and it's very similar to what, what you and I experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan, like, you know, transitioning, you know, people giving you crap, you know, going back to school, you know, starting a family, college. Mm. I mean, hell, I'm still learning as I go. You know, I'm still having a, I'm having a better transition, but, you know, I'm not perfect. Always learning, so, man. You got to always be learning. But, yeah, like I said, the two books, uh, Change or Die or What It's Like to Go to War. Those are both good, solid books. I'm glad I'm, re- I'm finishing one of them right now, but they're very – 
it, it hits you in the, it hits you in the soul you know it makes you like think yeah you know all right uh next question what's your favorite quote and why man there's a few i know but uh probably the most like recent quote that i heard is people can be friendly but they cannot be your friend does that make that does that make sense like you know people can be friendly to you but like always try to you know separate personal from business yeah I mean, I, I deal with people all the time that try to befriend me, but you, you'll know when when you're going through a rough time, you'll know who your true friends are. Yeah. Everyone says, oh, you know, 22 push-ups, you know, suicide bets is now. Yeah, you say that, but when you're in the rut yourself, you'll know who will call you. You'll know who, who, who will check up on you. You'll know. Yeah. And last question, where do you see yourself in a year, five years, or even 10 years from now? Well, hopefully not dead, but I hope my business is still booming and I hope, uh, you know, I could get big enough to where people work more and more work for me or work under me or that, or like go back to school. Um, maybe have a, a relationship. We'll see. Uh, maybe, I don't know, man, maybe travel the world, see the nice side of the world. I, I want to see more of the nice side of the world. I've seen so much death and so much hate and, you know, kind of, it's exhausting. I kind of want to see people just be nice or just travel to see ni- parts of the world I haven't seen before. Um, actually, tomorrow, I'm watching a Asian elephant at the Columbus Zoo. My parents got me an early birthday present. Mm-hmm. I'm going wa- to be watching a big elephant tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome, it. man. That's- like, I want to go I, I want to go around the world and see critters like that, you know? That's an experience you haven't had. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, uh, so... For those of you guys listening, so talking to John Crowley here. Um, John, I appreciate you for coming on, man, and sharing your story. Um, and, yeah, man, I appreciate what you're doing and helping helping the civilians, uh, the skills that you learned while you were uh, in the military as a Navy corpsman and actually making it a difference because, um, like we talked about before, the, the skills that you're teaching them is helping them save people's lives. And, um uh, just want to commend you and uh, tell you that uh, that's very appreciated, man. Well, Chief, I appreciate you. And uh, do you have a Suicide Charlie tattoo or no? No, I don't. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. yeah. See, that's a, that kill, people get cracked up. They're like, you don't have a Suicide Charlie yeah. tattoo? I'm like, no, man. Yeah, all my Marines had those for some, but no, I would not. No. <laughs> yeah, a lot of my uh, Marines are corn my generation. And I was like, the go- if, like, even if you're on a mute, everyone gets it. Like, oh, man. You gotta get the suicide truck. I'm like, I'm good, man. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, John, so how can our audience stay in touch with you? Uh, you can reach me on Instagram at jcrow8404, or you can email me at John Crowley at jcrowconsult.com, or just look up my website, jcrowconsult.com. I'm still working out the kinks with what I just haven't been, I gotta play catch up on like, you know, videos, pictures, posts, because I've just been so busy and I just got off the fire shifts. So, you know, working doing the business and doing going between two fire departments it can kind of keep you busy yeah no worries at all you man I, like i said man we appreciate it um thanks for coming on hey chief thank you and uh let me know if you need anything you know hopefully we meet in person and don't have too much fun in <laughs> awesome bro take care all right later thank you hey everyone raiden here I just want to thank you for listening to our podcast and make sure you guys go check out our website fortist-fidelis.com again that's fortist-fidelis.com and learn how you can help us support in providing these memorial coins to the families of the fallen and make sure you guys go follow our social media on Facebook FRTS FDLS again that's FRTS FDLS and on Instagram and Twitter at FRTS underscore FDLS again that's FRTS underscore FDLS and make sure you guys go subscribe review and leave a comment on our podcast on all the podcast platforms till then take care